make this great nation true. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Take out one of the Bibles and open up to page 837. The pages are there and the quotes the numbers are there. In the Gospel of our Lord that was proclaimed by the Holy Evangelist in Matthew, the sixth chapter, verses 14 and 15, read, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, of man. First of all, I want to explain to you that, you know, sometimes when things are translated, people use the language at that time. For example, back in the 1930s, the Antiochian Archives was the first Orthodox jurisdiction to use English when they translated the scriptures, when they translated the services. And the language that was pervasive, or let's say the churchy language that was pervasive in those days, instead of saying you and your is thine and thou and he, this more flowery English type of English. Some people translated trans trespasses, which in Arabic is khadaya, which means sin. They translated it to debts. There's a difference between debts and trespasses. Every time I talk about this, I think of riding uh, on the back roads when I lived up in the Poconos in Pennsylvania, and they would have signs of no trespassing, trespassers will be prosecuted, so on and so forth. Nobody ever said no debtors, said trespassers. The trespass is to go upon that which is not yours when you don't have the right to be there. You are trespassing. A debt is something that you incur that you owe. So in reality, we say, forgive us our trespasses. We're thinking, please, Lord, forgive us all the time when we went in place or did things that we should not have done, as we forgive those who have done the same to us. So what we need to do, in fact, we talked about this on Friday at our weekly liturgy, our breakfast afterwards, the art of forgiveness. The art of forgiveness. In order to have forgiveness, there's one key, key word. Oh, I don't know if Everybody knows, so I'm just going to pick on uh, my friend Bill Moore. What would you think is one of the things necessary in order to come about to forgive someone? In other words, if one's done something wrong, I know about the love of God, that's not what I'm looking for. What, what would help you forgive that person? Any idea? Try to understand the person. Ah, I don't understand the person. The word is empathy. Empathy. You know, we live in Florida, and there seems to be some sort of a, of a Florida fungus. <laughs> that when people move to Florida, and they catch the Florida fungus, they don't want anybody else to live here. Everybody else has moved down here. They got in, and now they're on a closed gate. I heard you say, you know, you got in here. Empathy. I hear this sometimes about people referring to migrants. Uh, and whether they're legal or not is not what I'm getting at. I don't want to get into that. It's a whole different discussion. But the empathy, the feeling for where they have come from, what they did to get you, what they struggled with in that society, no one should live like that. No one should live in fear. We don't have to just talk about migrants. We could talk about up north or places where people have drive-by shootings. This week, this week, you saw in Pine Hills, and there's a reason, you know, Craig, why they call it Crime Hills. Yeah. A local newsman was sitting in, in the van doing his job. And this person came up and killed him. And then they went on, shot a woman in her house and killed a nine-year-old child. How do you have empathy for that? Well, there was no empathy for what they did. You kind of say they were the evil, and what we should learn what drove this person or what happened to them was never in the right in any way, shape, or form. But what, what were the conditions? What were the circumstances? What was the history? Now, some people say, oh, well, you know, with that, we forgive everybody. Hello? That's what Jesus told us to do, to forgive. But we need to do something with the problem. So empathy is meaning that I can feel for what you did 
And that helps me to be reconciled because reconciliation drives us to forgive, to let it go. You have to give up your pain and your hurt. Now, everybody sitting here has some pain and hurt. Everybody in this room, those of downstairs, whatever, you have some pain and hurt. Things that, things that happen to you, right? If I have someone, and I did this last night, I want to let you know, this is going to be a great time. There's a person that I'm related to, who this is, that is angry at me, and I have no idea. I did not come up with being honest. I have nothing. I mean, I keep thinking about what did I do to this person. Today is the day of Sunday. So what did I do? Before I went to bed, I sent him a text. I said, tomorrow is Forgiveness Sunday, where we're called upon to forgive those who have done things to us or whatever. I said, and if I have done anything that you have a problem with, let me just take it as I remember it. I asked for forgiveness. I haven't heard back from them yet. So I was talking to them about that. And they said, was that difficult for you to write? I said, it was. But let me tell you why it was difficult for me to write. Not because I'm judging them. No. And not because I have any upset or anger with them. No. It's because I feel the answer I'm going to get, which I think is going to be self-righteous on their part, and, da, 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 and that, that is painful to me. But I sent the text anyhow because that's what we're called to do. So I can understand, I know this person. I know the way they grew up. I know what problems they had. I know how they were treated. And therefore, that enables me to be more forgiving. But we have to learn to give it up. The word forgive means to so let it go. Let it go already. We have people that have been angry since they were maybe before teenagers, and they're still angry. I don't have the energy, nor do I have the time, nor do I have the desire to stay angry at anybody. It's just a heavy load that I don't need to be bearing. I have enough things in my life to worry about whether somebody, oh, they did. And you know, this is very true. I know that ladies, you know this is true. You know it's true. Not good to young. Where's my friend Janet? Ah, there you are. Gene. Gentlemen, let me tell you something. Whatever you do, even if your wife says it's okay, even if you say I'm sorry, and she says it's okay, he is locked in the computer in her room. And it shall come forth whenever it is necessary to bring it about. I mean, I've had people tell me, you promised to do this 25 years, and you're still in fact, my son is here, I'll tell you, my daughter is here. Children are very smart. You ever notice they come when you're busy? Hey, can we go to Disney World? And you just want to keep doing what you're doing, say, yeah, okay. Right? Then later on, they come back and say, blah, blah, blah. I never did, I was very, thank you, God, I was very shocked about that. I say, not now, I can't talk. What I'm getting at is that we need to let it go. Because what it is, it's a stone hanging around us and it's dragging us down and it keeps us from the Lord. But God, it says in verse 16, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance where they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to men to be fasting. Fasting, first of all, let's understand that please do not tell people Oh, I'm a member of the Orthodox Church, and we fast for 40 days. No, you don't. Try fasting for 40 days, you will be dead. You're not fasting, you're abstaining. You're not eating certain things. But you're not fasting. Yes, you're fasting for a Holy Communion. There are a few things in the year which they are after fasting. But what we do for 40 days is we learn to abstain. So it says here, and to some people, fasting is painful. Uh, two weeks ago, our topic on our Friday morning was, uh, what do you hope to get out of Lent? And someone had answered previously to get through it. <laughs> to get through it. I'm sorry to tell you, there are people that come to Divine Energy and they're just trying to get through it. They're not into it at all, so they're trying to get through it. Nobody goes to a concert to try and get through it. So my point is that fasting to some people is painful because why? They're more concerned about their food than anything else because they are fasting from things that enslave them. Let me tell you something. Yesterday I was talking to somebody in confession. 
And I told them, you know, fasting, and, and you can share this if you want. We have six weeks of fasting, of abstaining. I got it down, I got it down man, to a science. First week, angel hair spaghetti. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, angel hair spaghetti. Second week, lentils and uh, couscous. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Third week, Lenten, particular dish I like called kidney nail, which is made from uh, what called kidney beans. And then I go over. So someone said to me, gee, Father, doesn't it get boring even saying, hello, that's what it's supposed to be. You're not supposed to be thinking about the food. Hey, what's for dinner? Spaghetti, what's for dinner? Spaghetti, what's for dinner? Spaghetti, get quiet, you stop asking. The ultimate example of that, and I've mentioned before, but I'd love to mention talk about it, is in the seminary. Up in Yonkers, New York, St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary. Now, I don't know what they do anymore, but years ago, you know, let me see if I can change remember this. Do you remember what I told you about email? Of what the seminary going to To this day, I don't know why I need to make soup. Tomato soup, tomato soup. All right, well, in fact, one time, you know, we had a number of Ethiopian students there. Many of them were Middle Eastern background. So they brought a big pot, and this big, of lentils and rice, for it now to each other. And the priest, who they call him the disciplinarian, he always checked everything. He said, what, what is this? What is this? We told him what it was. He said, hmm. Two huge spoons that were there, they were that big. He's going through it like this <laughs> to see where, because he had taste. He goes, no, there's got to be meat. It's too good. He's going, he's, he's searching for it. I said, Father, call up the archbishop. There's no meat in this. In fact, the kidney and egg that I mentioned before was a substitute for a meat dish. When God the saw Bishop Antoine came to visit, I had some during lunch. And he looked at it. You know, for those that remember Bishop Antoine, he could yell sometimes. Okay. In fact, you see how big Subdeacon Chaz is? He was afraid of him the first few times he came here. So he looked at that and he says to me, in Arabic, you're ashamed of yourself. Orthodox priest, meat during Lent? I said, Your Grace, it's not meat. He said, Of course it's meat. I said, It's not meat. It's Lenten. He said, No, no it's not. I said, Just try it. He said, I'm not a trusting person. <laughs> He said, you eat it first. <laughs> Somebody came over and said, say it, it's not meat. And he tasted it. Oh my God. The point that I'm bringing out is that for some people, if you are concentrated on your belly, it's fasting is very different. But if you're not, that was the whole purpose of making it lentil so that you weren't thinking about the food. Because believe it or not, one of the few things that drives people universally is what they're going to eat. Now I will confess, forgive me. I can be eating breakfast. I'm thinking about what I'm going to eat for dinner. Some people say, well, Father John, you're thinking because you don't like meat. I say, are you crazy? Or they're going to say, well, Father John doesn't like meat. I say, are you crazy? I am a carnivore. I love to eat, OK? But at this time of the year, I back off because there are more important things that I want to eat, like the grace of God. So addition is a form, and these things, it's an addiction. It's a form of bondage. Do you realize that? When you are in bondage, okay, let's see, Suzanne, because she's, she's from Boston, and they know English very well. All right, you and your, it's just, it wouldn't be known if it wasn't from Boston. What does the word bondage mean? Bondage. Everybody in this room, every one of you, if you smoke cigarettes, you're in bondage. You're in bondage to cigarettes. You are. If you overeat, you're in bondage to food. If you drink, I don't even know, a little bit of wine. If you drink, you're in bondage. If you're addicted to television, oh, wait, forget about television. <laughs> yes, I got it. Yeah.
see if anybody talked, if anybody sent us a message, if there's any email out there. You know, yesterday, I didn't get to check my phone for two days. I had 459 emails. Look, 400, I'm nobody. 459 emails. Do you go through the email, all the emails you get? Oh, wait, you get. Yeah, this is spam. This is spam. You know what I did? I did more. Oh yeah, I know. But the point is, I addicted. So I am not addicted to the phone. The only, in fact, I'm one of the few people that you know that actually answers the phone. Unless it says scam likely, I answer the phone because it could be somebody that needs something. Okay. Most people don't. They don't answer the phone because what? Oh, I, it could be a a, a, a sales girl. Yesterday, a guy called me up. It's God done the truth. Hello. I would like to speak to a with somebody else. I said, oh, thank you for calling me. I live alone. I'm so lonely. Nobody ever talks to me. And, and before I said, he hung up. <laughs> so I said, oh, you're mean. I said, no, I'm not mean. I didn't, I didn't say it was the end of I just I made me feel like they actually talked or something. So my point is that we need to get away from our addiction. There's one addiction that I have that you don't, you may have, which would be great, and you don't need to get away from it, it's to him. My children will tell you that. I love my children. I love my grandchildren. I love them more. Because he gave me my children. He gave me my grandchildren. He gave me everything in my life. So yes, I am addicted to Jesus Christ. Some of you could call me a Jesus freak. That would only be because if they think that being connected to Jesus is freaky, but I am addicted to that. And finally, it says in verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Empty your closets. Yeah, empty your closets. Empty your food pantries, the extras you don't need, your mad money. Because when you die, it's all staying here. All the clothing hanging in your closet that you don't need, there's a poor, homeless person that needs it. All the shoes you have in that closet, there's a poor, homeless person that needs it. All that food that you have in your closet that you know you're not going to eat, it belongs in the stomach of the poor and of the homeless. Because when we enter into Lent, we're supposed to be getting rid of all the things that keep us away from Jesus Christ. But these things, Hold us back. Spread some of it around. Because let me tell you what happens. When you empty that closet, when you give away that food, when you let go of that money, when you do all that, you become God's conduit to those people. People have to put their sleep on here on Sunday every night. Every night. It's like a, like a, a homeless camp. Right on, on the I don't want to sign the shirt that was lost. Somebody came and said, well, you know, you need to get them to go. I said, why? This is their phone. One of the people that works in the church said something to me which really, really resonated with me. He said, Father John, I have to do these things to keep the church to be good because it's my home. This church is your home. This church is your home. I know you live someplace else, but this church is your home. This church is where you will go last before you go to that cemetery. It will be in this home. Those things that you're addicted to, whether it be pornography, so many people are addicted to pornography. So many people are addicted to eating and eating and eating and eating. So many people are addicted to drink. So many people are addicted to not only drugs, if you ask me what is my what is the one, and some will argue it is or it isn't a drug, as far as I'm concerned, it's a drug. And that's why when anybody tries to convince me that marijuana has some good to it, I hate, I hate marijuana. I hate it. Why? Because people overuse it to escape from the reality in which they are instead of changing the reality. Last week, the air wasn't working. No one, and I'm not picking on anybody, nobody came to me and said, Father well, John, what can we do? What can I do? What can I contribute to get the air going? 
My youngest son, Dr. Sobey, is his dad. I've watched you for all those years, since 1976, come in on a Sunday, the air conditioner is not working, and it destroys your whole day. We had to do something about it. I asked him and went around until we got it fixed. My friends, we're going to start Lent tomorrow. And some of these people are being something that you've got to get through. For all these things, there's a diet. He told me that one time. Lent is not just a diet. Fasting is not a diet. It has to have a purpose. Now, today at 2 o'clock, if you go downstairs and some of you, we have a, a teaching where I hope you will come to because it's very, very beneficial, the teaching. We're going to have Forgiveness Sunday Vespers. Come back up. When you come down to be anointed, you should turn to the person behind you, wherever they are. And when you say forgive me, mean it. Mean it. Because when we let go of our animosities, our anger, our hurts, our pains, our bad memories, we let go that we are free to enter into a false tradition.